Golden State Media Concepts bring you Book Review Podcast, a haven for bookworms of all ages and the widest genres, from mystery to memoirs, romance to comedy, fantasy to sci-fi. If you love to read, this is the podcast for you. It's the Golden State Media Concepts Book Review Podcast. Welcome to the GSMC Book Review Podcast, brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network. I am your host, Sarah, and it's Tuesday, so you know what that means. It means an author interview, which I love. Today's author is Karen Stefano, and her book is called What the Body Remembers. And actually, before I get to even the subtitle, I do want to give a quick note, uh, a quick trigger warning that this is a memoir. It is about um, an assault that Karen experienced and the aftermath of that assault, the PTSD, etc. So um, just want to give warning for that in case this is not something that you should listen to for your own health. Um, so the book is called um, What the Body Remembers, A Memoir of Sexual Assault, and and it tells Karen's story on a summer night in 1984 19-year-old UC Berkeley sophomore Karen Thomas leaves her uniformed patrol job and walks home alone in darkness at the threshold of her apartment a man assaults her at knife point after a soul-chilling struggle she manages to escape though she is left traumatized by her assault and the subsequent tri trial of her attacker she herself goes on to become a criminal defense lawyer defending those accused of crimes as heinous as the one committed against her fast forward to 2014 30 years after her assault when her life once again appears to be crumbling as she stumbles her way through the days navigating a dying marriage devastating financial loss and an elderly mother slipping into dementia she becomes fascinated by her own anxiety and PTSD why does the body remember what the mind tries so desperately to forget her questions prompt a delayed obsession with her assailant what became of him? What is he doing now? She begins a quest of excavation, determined to track him down. What she discovers is life-altering. So that is the description of What a Body Remembers, uh, a memoir of sexual assault and its aftermath. Sorry, I missed that part of the subtitle earlier when I said it. I, I cut it off abruptly. Um, this book reads like a novel. Um, but it is a memoir. It uh, is really fascinating, the experience that Karen went through, and then her, uh, first the assault, and then the um, the trial that she went through that was uh, just as victimizing to her as the assault was, and then the resulting PTSD and anxiety that she experienced. And it's really powerful and really emotional to read through this book, but... Um, she writes with humor and uh, honesty and looks at her life through this lens, yes, but also um, through the lens of how she came through this experience and what it, how it affected her life and, and where she is now because of this experience and some of the things that resulted from it. So as I said, it reads like a novel. It's really, it's, it's really engaging. Um, engaging in terms of it, it sucks you in, keeps you uh, riveted to her story because you want to know what is going to happen next. I, um, yeah, you know, I get a little, a little leery when I, when I see memoirs that have this topic because it can be emotionally draining. It can be triggering to read th books like this. Um, I have my own PTSD issues. Uh, for me, though, this book, thankfully, was not a trigger. And um, I actually, I, I can't say I enjoyed necessarily the content, you know, the, what the story was based on, but I really enjoyed Karen's look at her experience, the way she analyzes what she went through, how she shares that experience so that other women who have gone through it know that they are not alone, that other people are out there who have experienced something similar and how they got through it or, or what they did to keep moving forward. 
So I am going to now let Karen go ahead and tell you more about this story since it is her story. So let's go ahead and turn to my interview with author Karen Stefano. Again, the book is What the Body What a Body Remembers, a memoir of sexual assault and its aftermath. Hi Karen, welcome to the podcast. Well, thank you so much for having me, Sarah. I am excited to have you here. We are here to talk about your memoir. It's called What a Body Remembers. Before we get to the memoir, though, I would love to just have you share a little bit about yourself so my listeners can get to know you a bit. Uh, yeah, I am a, I'm a lawyer. I am a writer. I'm in my early 50s. I am about to get married in uh, just in about a week or so. So um, if anyone sees me on the street and my eye is twitching or my <laughs> hands are shaking, it's because I'm doing a book launch and a wedding all in the same month. So don't don't judge me. Uh, but I, I primarily identify uh, right now as a as a full time writer as I'm taking some time off to promote obviously what a body remembers and also just to continue writing whenever I can essays short stories uh, all, all kinds of different pieces. Mm -hmm. And um, did you plan that 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 uh, con that um sorry. The interaction, the, the dates coinciding with the wedding and the book launch, or did that just kind of happen? It, it just sort of happened. I <laughs> am marrying a wonderful man, uh, but a wonderful man with an incredibly busy schedule and a wonderful man with three teenage kids. And we were looking at the calendar and saying, okay, when can we do this wedding and I kid you not, with all the kids' schedules, someone's going to camp, someone's starting this program, someone's going to lacrosse camp. Um, uh, we had we had one weekend to work with, and I I knew that I on I know, and I at the time I thought this is. This is going to be challenging, but, you know, I can do it, no problem. And then now here we are, and I'm feeling a little nuts. But um, all, these, are, these, are all, these are all quality problems, though. So um, uh, I'm sure no one is feeling sorry for me. <laughs> well, it is, it, it's, it's a whole bunch of a good thing, but, you know, it, it, right. maybe it would be better to spread those good things out a little more. <laughs> right. Right, yeah, note to self. <laughs> um, at any rate, tell us a little bit about what a body remembers. Uh, yeah, so what a body remembers is, uh, the, the, the subtitle is A Memoir of Sexual Assault and Its Aftermath, and that kind of says it all. And... Um, it, it chronicles a, a very interesting life story with way too many twists and turns. But on a summer night in 1984, I was a 19-year-old UC Berkeley sophomore. And I worked uh, part-time as a University of California Police Department police aide. And that meant I wore a cop uniform. I didn't have a gun or a baton, uh, but I had everything else. The only thing that identified me as not an actual police officer was a tiny patch on my arm that identified me as aide. And so I worked a shift uh, one summer night, uh, ironically, walking other women home to safety. And I went back to the police station, changed out of my uniform, put on my regular uh, student clothes of uh, uh, pants, white flats, lavender backpack. And I walked home alone in darkness. 
And then at the threshold of my apartment, a man assaulted me at knife point. And after uh, just an absolutely soul-chilling struggle, I managed to escape. And even though I was left traumatized by my assault and the subsequent trial, jury trial of my attacker, uh, years later, I went on to law school. And though I had always planned on becoming a prosecutor, putting away the bad guys, I instead, paradoxically, became a criminal defense lawyer, defending people accused of crimes as heinous as the one committed against me. And then in the book, we fast forward to 2014, 30 years after my assault. And at that time, my life, once again, seemed to be crumbling. And I was stumbling my way through the days uh, I was navigating a dying marriage at the time, a uh, devastating financial loss, and my mother was at that point slipping into dementia. And I became fascinated by my own anxiety and the PTSD that had resurfaced from the assault. And I asked myself, why does the body remember what our mind so desperately tries to forget? And these questions prompted what can only be called, it was a delayed obsession, really. There's no other word for it than obsession um, with my assailant. I wondered, whatever became of him? What's he doing now? And I began this quest of, excavation really uh, determined to track him down and I won't give away any spoilers for the book but what I found out was nothing less than life altering. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so you, you, you chronicle your experience in the book about the assault and about the aftermath which again I don't want to give too much away but the the aftermath was almost as traumatizing as the actual assault in terms of how right. the trial process worked. When you started writing the process, it sounds like you were writing it from um, kind of an interesting place in your life. Was the process then cathartic or did it trigger more anxiety? How, how did that work for you? Uh, yeah, that's a great, that's a great question. Uh, it wasn't, it was not cathartic at all. Uh, <laughs> it was incredibly triggering. And um, the, the PTSD I referenced was to the sound of footsteps because uh, before um, my attacker made his move, he was just a man kind of jogging down the sidewalk uh, close to midnight. And in, in Berkeley, it's a, you know, it, uh, it's, an, it, it's an interesting city and a, and a guy just kind of jogging down the street close to midnight is no big deal. So I, I hear his footsteps. Um, I see him. I kind of look and assess, is this person a danger? I decide no. I turn back around to go uh, continue my walk through the hallway to my apartment, and then the footsteps changed course. I turn back around, and he just he had these wild blue eyes, and they just locked on mine, and then I saw the knife in his hand. So, um, so my PTSD was with the the sound of footsteps. And so when I set about the task of researching and writing this book, that trigger of footsteps came back with just a vengeance. And uh, there's a, a story that I, I've shared before. One morning, uh, I'm in San Diego, it's 8.30 in the morning, I'm walking to my office downtown. It's broad daylight. There are plenty of people out. 
and I hear the sound of footsteps behind me, and uh, it's a guy jogging, as people do, (laughs) Mm -hmm. and um, I couldn't control myself, and I spun around, and um, and this this poor man, um, he was just jogging, and he hadn't done anything wrong, and he just saw the look on my face, and you know he knew he knew that something bad had happened to me, and he just he was he was so kind, and he just apologized profusely even though he'd done nothing wrong, obviously. Mm-hmm. Um, and, but, but, but yeah, so that's, that's what was going on with me basically the whole time I was researching and writing this book. It was so, it was, it was incredibly triggering. It's kind of a weird place maybe to um, jump in here, but we do need to take our first break of the podcast. When we come back, we'll be talking more about Karen's story as well as her writing process and uh, lots of other topics. So stay tuned. You're listening to the GSMC Book Review Podcast, and I will be right back. Hi, this is Sarah, host of the GSMC Book Review Podcast, here to talk to you about The Emissary, book one of the One Great Year series. Written by Tamara Veach and Renny DeFazio, The Emissary is the journey of soulmates, of good versus evil, and of how humanity evolves over time. I was reading a book by Graham Hancock called Fingerprints of the Gods, and in that book he outlines this alternative history that there was a much older civilization than we are currently taught in schools, but it was completely wiped off the face of the earth by some major catastrophe. And it, I thought, what? why isn't everybody in the world talking about this? Marcus and Helgul are the only characters in the story who have past life memory, and the two are involved in a battle between good and evil as this story unfolds. The, the whole relationship between Helgul and Marcus shows the importance of how what choice you make in what in every moment dictates where your life goes and who you become and you can always change that and Marcus and Helgul are on that journey together of making choices and you see how totally different their lives are even though their beginnings were the same. The Emissary shows how every soul has a purpose, how all lives have meaning, and how we are all connected. If you want more information about this book and this series, Tamara and Rennie were recently guests on the GSMC Book Review podcast, so check out episode 162 to hear their interview. Their books are available at Amazon.com or by ordering through your favorite bookstore. If you're searching for an epic adventure to read this summer, the One Great Year series might just be what you're looking for. Welcome back to the GSMC Book Review Podcast. I am speaking today uh, with author Karen Stefano about her her memoir, What a Body Remembers. Before the break, she had been talking about um, the process of writing the book and the way that, that, uh, that the process was very triggering for her in her PTSD. So let's go ahead and get back to that interview with Karen. And how did you how did you eventually navigate through that? Did you, was, was, did you get therapy or was the writing process eventually cathartic? How did that turn out? Um, the, the writing process for me, uh, and this is, this is an interesting topic because a lot of people write about trauma and, um, and I'm sure everyone's experience is a little bit different, but it was the first draft that was really the most triggering. Once I got into the editing process of of making sure, you know, that a scene worked on the page, uh, it was it, it became more mechanical. I was more distant distanced from my own story. And all I cared about was does, is this scene working? And so that 
that's kind of how I how I made it through. The first draft, I was reliving my own trauma, uh, and in and in the editing process, I was just a writer writing about almost some some other person. Mm-hmm. And how did how did you get through that first draft? Then what what kept you going? Uh, just just a, de- a determination to tell my story. Uh, I I do have a, a wonderful therapist who um, I've seen for years and years, and some you know on on an as needed basis. And um, you know sometimes I'll go months without seeing him because I'm feeling like I have my own toolkit to for for coping with uh, life. And uh, I definitely saw him a lot during this during this writing process, and I just tried to engage in what are my personal standard self care techniques, and they're pretty simple. I'm getting sleep, eating, uh, going to therapy as necessary, exercising. That's the best therapy in the world for me personally. And, um, and then just giving myself plenty of what I call downtime. And that consists of sitting in bed and (laughs) binge watching (laughs) shows, uh, snuggled up with my cats. Um, uh, but yeah, just, you know, that's, that's my self, that's my self care plan. And, uh, I know everyone has one. Uh, we don't always, uh, use, you know, utilize our, our, our self care plan, but, uh, that's what I did. That's how I got through it. And there were some rough days. Mm-hmm. And then in your work as a defense attorney now, um, I know you said that eventually it kind of, it, kind of got better before getting worse, but how have you managed triggering events that I'm sure happen occasionally in your work? Yeah, well, actually, so, and so just to be clear, uh, I'm no longer a criminal defense lawyer. I practiced criminal defense for eight years. Uh, This was in the 90s, and that, that piece of my life is also chronicled in What a, What a Body Remembers. And, um, uh, and, and I address directly in the book, uh, the apparent paradox of me, uh, being a, an assault survivor and then going on to defend people accused of the same crimes committed against me and, and, and worse crimes. Um, so I address that directly in the book. But, you know, it's interesting, Sarah, during my criminal defense years, I don't I don't know what it was if if I finally had found a voice in the courtroom, a voice that I didn't feel like I had when I was the victim in the courtroom. Um, And but even though I was dealing with these um, damaged flawed human beings i i never felt triggered then and i and i don't really know why uh there were a couple of times where i'd be uh sitting in the county jail seated across the table from my client and uh you know no cuffs no you know nothing nothing restraining them and and Occasionally, I would think it was like, you know, just like suspension of, uh, like, of, uh, of all reality. Every now and then, it would enter my head, you know, if I make this person angry, he can just lunge again across the table and snap my neck, and the, the deputies, uh, in the other room, uh, are probably having a cup of coffee and they won't even <laughs> they won't even notice but uh literally, literally those thoughts only entered my head uh, a few times and uh representing these individuals was hugely empowering for me mhm 
Yeah, and you juxtapose your story with um, – because you, you start in 1995 talking about a, a case that you were you were defending a man who – it's not an exact correlation, but he assaulted a woman. Um, and so you, mm-hmm. you start there, and then you move to your story, and then you move back to that. Can you talk a little bit about that juxtaposition in the writing process? Yeah. Um, it, it, the, the, the juxtaposition is – and again, as I said, um, you know, people don't expect a victim of a brutal crime to go on to become a criminal defense attorney. Uh, and it's something that, you know, some people might have difficulty reconciling. And like I said, this is something I address directly in the book within the full context of all my life experience. And when you read my story, I think the rationale for this paradox becomes clear, um, but it was an unexpected path and one I, I wouldn't change. Um, for eight years of my legal career, I was defending the rights of the poorest most damaged, most underprivileged people in our society. And those were 99.9% of my clients. And to, you know, going back to your question about the juxtaposition, I think it's what makes my story so interesting because the, you know, the victim who goes on to become a prosecutor, well, you know, that, that was my plan. Um, Mm -hmm. And in, and in terms of a story, that's expected, but it's really not very interesting. Um, but a victim who suffers a brutal assault, who worked in law enforcement, who then goes on to defend people accused of atrocious crimes, who's really good at it, who's good at her job, and who sees the humanity even in those clients who've committed some pretty atrocious acts and who finds her own voice doing that work, I think that's a story w- worth reading about. And that's and that was the rationale for me juxtaposing my own uh, experience as quote-unquote victim uh, against my uh empowered story uh, representing uh, people charged with crimes. Mm-hmm. It, it's, um, it's 1984, and, and the, that was the year of your attack. Um, things mm-hmm. have somewhat changed a little bit in terms of how yes. victims are perceived, but unfortunately, in your case, especially with working in law enforcement, you didn't receive a lot of support really um yeah. it felt more like just you were blamed as the victim um wh- and and there's there's some great scenes of people trying to help and just not helping right. at all but what do you wish right. that someone had had actually told you after the attack what would have been helpful um i think the one of the most traumatizing things for me, I mean, there's the trauma from the assault, but then there was the secondary trauma from the criminal justice system. And I was an incredibly naive 19 year old. um, I guess I was 20 by the time of the jury trial. But I had even though I worked for a police department and walked around wearing a cop uniform. I had a, I was incredibly ignorant and had only a television um, uh, television understanding of the criminal justice system, and so if the DA prosecuting my case could have just spent a little bit more time with me and told me, hey, here's what's going to happen. A, B, C, D, and here's what might happen, and here's your role, and this is why you don't get to be in the courtroom during the proceedings. 
except for your own testimony. If someone had just talked to me and walked me through that, the whole process would have been so much easier on me. And uh, and and you're right, things have changed a lot since the 80s. And I most DA's offices have a victim liaison unit. People are better at communicating. And so I, I think things have changed a lot for the better in that respect. But going back to your question, what do I wish someone had told me? I wish someone had just told me, hey, here's the process. And uh, here's here's what you can expect. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you really weren't told anything. I mean, it's just amazing yeah. reading no. through that, yeah. how that all worked out. Before we move on to the next topic, let's go ahead and take our second break of the podcast. When we come back, we will have the conclusion with this interview with Karen. Stay tuned. You're listening to the GSMC Book Review Podcast, and I will be right back. Tired of searching the vast jungle of podcasts? Now listen close and hear this out. There's a podcast network that covers just about everything that you've been searching. The Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network is here. Nothing less than a podcast bliss with endless hours of podcast coverage. From news, sports, music, fashion, cooking, entertainment, fantasy, football, and so much more. So stop lurking around and go straight out to the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. Guaranteed to fill that podcast itch. Whatever it may be, visit us at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter and download us on iTunes, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Welcome back to the GSMC Book Review Podcast. And as I said before the break, we uh, now have the conclusion to my interview with author Karen Stefano about her newly released memoir. With the recent Me Too movement, um, do you feel like that has influenced the way you tell your story in any way? Um, No, actually. And the the funny thing is, so... um, I started working on this book uh, 2013. I kind of thought about it and doubted whether or not the story had any interest to anyone besides me. And then as I shared uh, with more and more you know, women uh, what my might be book was about, so many of them said, yeah, I, I hear you. Something like that happened to me too. And that, those were the words they used. And they would share their own story. And then that simple act of sharing, I felt, unburdened them a little bit. At least that's what I like to believe. But this was before the Me Too movement. And so... As as I had these conversations, I started to realize I had to write this book because it's important to speak out. It's important to let let others know they're not alone and to let everyone know that there are a lot of ways to heal. So I I feel like the Me Too movement uh, helps make my book uh, more relevant today but i i did the writing uh pre me too movement so um it didn't that that movement didn't affect the the writing at at all mm-hmm. and this is um this is a change of subject but i was just thinking about the the relationship with your with your mom in the book and how mm-hmm. a lot of your anxiety obviously stems from the attack but then it, you you had the you had the foundations for that anxiety from your relationship sure. with your mom and, and how she grew up etc uh, has has that relationship 
cha- I mean, obviously she later on had dementia, so of course that relationship changed. But in the in the intervening years, did your relationship change at all with your mom? So, um, you, you know, there were, you know, my, there was my, there were my growing up years and obviously I was imprinted with my mother's anxiety. And uh, for people listening, I'm not spoiling anything in the book, but my, my mother had a horrific childhood and mm-hmm. that left a mark. And uh, it's interesting, you, you go into a therapist's office and the first question they ask you is, how was your childhood? And my answer has always been, uh, it was great, it was wonderful, um, but uh, there's this one thing, my mom had this anxiety problem and gee, maybe, it, is it possible that it rubbed off on me at all? And which they replied, duh. <laughs> <laughs> um, but um, uh my mom uh her whole life she she suffered from pretty significant anxiety and um i don't know that our i mean our relationship changed just because i evolved into an adult and as an adult i i, I think hopefully we grow and we evolve and we see our parents as human beings and human beings uh they have their strengths and they have their weaknesses and um so i i just i i think that i came to just feel more empathy toward my mom um mm-hmm. my mom and i had a great relationship uh she she died i saying in the past because she she died uh just a uh Two months ago, mm-hmm. um, and thank you. Um, and then, of course, she was she had she was gone before that because right. uh, in the book in 2014 she was just starting to slip into the dementia, and then that she kind of went out over the cliff, and uh, and so my mother was existed physically, but she, my my mother was gone. Right. Um, uh, but uh but yeah I mean I we always we always had a good relationship and and uh uh and yes she imprinted me with her anxiety uh but that wasn't of her, that wasn't of her choosing um mm-hmm. uh she you know she absolutely uh was a a wonderful mother and she and I know she did the did the best she could yeah yeah, thank you. Uh, you, according to your website, have another book called The Secret Game of Words. Can you yes. talk a little bit about that? Yeah, so The Secret Games of Words is uh, a short story collection. It came out in 2015, and it's uh, it's a collection of stories, most of which had been published uh, elsewhere in and various literary journals, and then it also includes a few stories that had that had never appeared any place else. And uh, it was my first uh, collection of fiction uh, that I published. I had another book uh, that came out in 2011, but it was a how-to business writing guide, so very very different. And uh, yeah, it's a it's a great collection. I'm very proud of it. It's it is fiction, but I think with all fiction, there is always a piece of truth in 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 it. And I I definitely think that's uh, the case with that book. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and you said that you know you you continue writing um, essays, short stories, etc. Will you be working doing another book? I will be, uh, at, and that's a funny story, actually. When I um, started working on What a Body Remembers, I put my novel on the back burner, and I, my attitude was like, oh, God, this is going to be so easy. All I'm doing is just writing about stuff that actually happened. How hard <laughs> can that be? I'll ha- you know, I'm going to bang this out and four months and then I can go back to my novel and I'll have 
you know, an extra book published. And so, <laughs> ha, 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 here we are, you know, uh, so many years later. But yeah, I do, I do plan to go back to that novel and, and, and dust it off. And I actually, the other day, took out the, the, the files, the hard copies of the, the draft. And you know how it is in the writing process. You, you go back and look at your pages over the space, you know, with the, with a little time in between and you say, Oh yeah, that's kind of good. Yeah. Oh yeah. That's terrible. Okay. That's <laughs> gotta go. That's gotta go. And right. so that's, that's kind of where I am right now. <laughs> In all of your in all of your spare time that you have, obviously, right, right, exactly, exactly, <laughs> going on. Yeah. Um, and then, uh, what? When did you start writing? Is it something that you always did, or did you come to it later? I mean, obviously, you you had to write as a lawyer, but that's a different kind of writing. When did you start writing yeah. in terms of um, fiction or you know other kinds of writing? Yeah, I I mean, I always enjoyed writing. Literally, as a kid. Uh, um, uh, it got lost or destroyed, but I still remember it fondly. I had the spiral notebook that I would write stories in as a child. So I, and then I was always just a voracious reader. Um, but I always enjoyed writing, uh, writing stories. And then it was just, it was just something, uh, that I, abandoned. Uh, I thought it was just a luxury to, to be able to do that. And I had to focus on my um, uh, academics and, and on my legal career. And then I, I turned back to it in earnest in 2007. And I decided I was going to take myself seriously as a writer and devote more time to it and cut back on uh, my hours as a lawyer. And so it's really since then that I've really identified as as a writer. And um, my first short story was published in 2009, and then uh i i published quite a few more in various literary journals and then of course released uh my short story collection the secret games of words in in 2015 and um and then meanwhile was working on on what a body remembers so uh you know writing is a you know you don't snap your fingers and then and become stephen king or or Amy Tan or Janet Fitch <laughs> over mm-hmm. overnight. Um, mm-hmm. it's, uh, it's a slow, uh, slow process. Yeah. This isn't a question per se. It's just something that made me smile as I was reading the book. And it, 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 you were writing a paper in the book during your college years and you were typing on a Selectrix and that just made me smile because <laughs> of, I, kept, I kept thinking, how many people are going to remember that? <laughs> or, you know, right, younger, I know. younger I know. readers are going to be like, what? What? I know. <laughs> um, and Sony Walkman, what the hell is that? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, no, it's it's pretty funny because, like, um, I, in in this book, I out myself as old. <laughs> <laughs> oh. But, no, I mean, but it, it's fun in terms of a, uh, it's not historical fiction, but it's fun in terms of like historic uh, reading, a period piece almost because, you know, you have to call your mom and you call and let the phone ring once and at a specified time and then you hang up and then she calls you back so you can avoid, you know, the phone bills or calling collect, which most people don't know about. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, people, right. Yeah, yeah. Younger people who are reading the book are like, I don't, what? What? I right. get this. <laughs> what is she talking about? <laughs> we had an intern a couple of years ago who did not understand long distance calls. He just did not accept that you had to pay for those. And then I tried to explain party lines to him. And I think it's like, <laughs> so that's so that's funny. Um, anyway, um, moving on from that, from your own experience <laughs> in terms of how you came to writing, do you have advice for aspiring authors? Yeah, I have. I, I have kind of two categories of 
advice. Um, one category is to writers in general. Um, do it. Just write. Um, I'm a big believer in butt in chair time. Um, and you just like have to sit there for a couple of hours and some days the words are going to come and some days they're, they're not. Uh, but you need to keep your butt in the chair and, uh, and, and, and be patient with yourself and you're, you're going to have good days and you're going to have bad days. And, but the important thing is to do it just right. And, so that sounds so simple, but uh, in, in terms of follow through, it's 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 remarkably difficult to comply with. And and then category two, I want to address writers who are considering writing about their own trauma. And I can speak from experience, uh, as we discussed earlier, Sarah, that. You, you're going to get triggered. And my advice to you is have a plan. Have a self-care plan in place. And um, be gentle with yourself. And, uh, you know, and if you feel like you're pushing yourself to the brink of a breakdown, maybe it's time to stop. Maybe it's time to go talk to your therapist. And, um, but, but, you know, in a nutshell, have a self-care plan in place if you're writing about your own trauma, whatever that trauma might be. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think that's very important to not, to, to not just go into it blindly, but to have a plan. So you can't, you can't plan for everything, but to plan at least ahead of time so you're not blindsided. Right. Yeah. Um, you also have a podcast. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah, um, I I do a podcast, uh, which I've done since 2015 through Rare Bird Radio. Um, Rare Bird uh, Books is uh, the publisher who pub published uh, What a Body Remembers. And uh, it's, it's sort of it's seasonal. I don't, uh, a lot of people podcast. Uh, you know, they record or uh, go live once a week. I I don't do that. I go in in again in seasons just to give myself a break and uh, allow myself time to kind of get caught up. And uh, Sarah, you're a podcaster, so you know that when you're when you're reading a book with the intention of doing a podcast with the author, it's a very different type of reading process. And because you're, because you're, you're kind of looking at it more critically and you're thinking of questions that interesting questions that you want to ask the author and yet being cautious about not doing any, you know, having any spoilers. And so I just, Sometimes I just need to take a break a few months off so I can read like a normal person. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, I, I, I mentioned this before, but I read a lot or I, I listen to a lot of audiobooks as I commute because that's the only way I get in the, uh, the personal reading, um, as opposed to the podcast reading. Mm hmm. Yeah. So it's, I, so, it's so interesting. It's, I've, be, I've become, um, an an audible addict. Uh, I didn't think I would like the experience of listening to books because I've just always been uh, the traditional reader. And mm -hmm. I have to share that um, uh, my book, What a Body Remembers, is on Audible. And I've only listened to a snippet of it because I'm not the narrator. An actress is narrating the book. And it's, it, it, you know, and the book is in first person. So right. it's so trippy for me to hear my story being told through someone else's voice. It's so, yeah. so bizarre. So bizarre. So That would be really so, weird. <laughs> yeah. So that's just, that's just an aside. But mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Yeah. 
Um, I know you have a website, so if you could uh, tell people where to find your website as well as where to find you on social media. Yeah, um, the the website is Stefano, S-T-E-F-A-N-O, Karen, K-A-R-E-N, dot com. And I'm on Twitter. Uh, I tweet a lot about my cats. So uh, fair warning. And my handle on Twitter is uh, kstefano1. And um, and then I'm also on Facebook, just under Karen Stefano. And on my website, there's a contact tab and with an email address. And so if anyone's listening who wants to uh, reach out to me, and uh, uh, I'm, I'm pretty good about responding to emails. So I would be happy to hear from anyone. Great. Thank you so much. So we've, we've gone through quite a few topics, um, but is there anything that we haven't talked about that you would like to mention in terms of um, your book or writing or anything else? Uh, uh, no. Um, I just, I, I thank you, Sarah, for your time and your interest in my book. And I, I do want to give a plug for it. Uh, what a Body Remembers is available at Barnes and Noble, it's on the site IndieBound, where you can uh, get it through independent bookstores. It's on Amazon. You can walk into your favorite local bookstore and ask for it. It's distributed by a pretty large distributor, so uh, it's easy for even uh, tiny local bookstores to to get it. Um, and uh, yes, visit my website. Uh, reach out to me, buy my book. <laughs> that's all. Um, that's that. That's about it. All those good things. Well, and I want to thank you as well for taking the time to be on the podcast, especially with everything else you've got going on right now. Right. Um, right. Good luck with with the book launch and um, have fun next weekend. I I will. I will. Once I'm once I'm there. Once I'm in I'm in the zone. I'll be. I'll be. I'll be great. <laughs> Just the last minute details. <laughs> yes, exactly. And congratulations to you and your fiance. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you once again to my guest, Karen Stefano, who not only took time out of her schedule um, with the book release and everything, but she also took time out of her schedule the week before her wedding. I was a mess the week before my wedding. I was packing to go to Montana. I was, uh, I don't even know what I was doing. I was a mess. I know that. I mean, I was excited and I was happy and I was organized, but I also don't think I could have been releasing a book and uh, talking coherently on a podcast. So kudos to you, Karen. That was awesome. And uh, thank you again for joining me. Thank you uh, also to you, my listeners. You know, I love you joining me every week to talk about books. Uh, speaking of that, I hope you will join me again on Friday for our next episode, which will be about books because it's always about books. Um, I just have to figure out what books I might be talking about for that episode. In fact, that brings me to a good point. If you have books that you love, series that you love, authors that you love, ideas for podcasts that you would like to throw my way, I would love to hear them. I, I may or may not utilize them, but I'm always looking for good ideas. And, and you know, I, I'm always talking about how long my TBR list is, but I'm always willing to add to that the length of that TBR list. So throw ideas my way. I love to hear them and get my brain jump started for new episodes. So thank you again to Karen. Thank you to you, my listeners. Hope you're having a great week. Join me again on Friday. But in the meantime, go find some time to get yourself lost in a good book. You've been listening to the Golden State Media Concepts Book Review Podcast, part of the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. You can find this show and others like it at www. 
gsmcpodcast.com. Download our podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Just type in GSMC to find all the shows from the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. From movies to music, from sports to entertainment, and even weird news. You can also follow us on Twitter and on Facebook. Thank you, and we hope you have enjoyed today's program. Thank you.